Gopal Bhatli, High Commissioner of India to Sri Lanka, former Speaker of the Parliament of Sri Lanka, Honorable Kharijai Surya, Her Excellency Koti Thanshu, Ambassador of Vietnam, Professor Don Makarenshi, our guest speaker of this evening, Dr. Prasad Samarasingha, Chairman of Hawaiian Corporation, President and members of the Sri Lanka India Society, Priya. Her Excellency Hothi Thar, Sri Lanka India Society and the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Centre, High Commission of India, Colombo. I warmly welcome you all to the Mahatma Gandhi Oration. Dr. John Makabenchi, Mrs. Renuka Ikanayanka, Director, South Cultural Centre. Dr. Deshapriya Vijayakunga, Director General, Sanko. like Mahatma Gandhi and brings his philosophy, teachings and the iconic presence of Mahatma Gandhi. So it's very interesting how in hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever was said on a lighter note, it did bring Mahatma Gandhi uh, to life and, uh, and it also brought uh, in, in uh, Professor Don's own uh, love to hear from Professor Don as well. Yeah, Formally begin the my address. I would say that for the people of my generation and even much older, it would have been perhaps a dream not realizable in our lifetime to see Mahatma. But we have Professor Don with us. Honorable Karuja Surya Ji, former speaker of the Sri Lanka Parliament. Your Excellency and my dear friend, the Ambassador of Thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Your Excellency, our Commissioner, we thank you for being here and hosting this wonderful event. Former Speaker Ambassador Tenchu, <coughs> Mr. Wichitunga, um, Mr. Reddy, my uh, new friend Dr. Vinya and his family welcomed me into their home. I stayed at Sarvadeya uh, for the last five days and uh, was treated to tea and toast with butter every morning sitting with <coughs> Mrs. He got them to pledge that they would not comply with this law in the name of God. Not just not comply, but in the name of God. And what he did at that moment was fuse together social action with spiritual value, which, as far as I know, had not been done before. To me, that was one of the great genius moments of human existence, as far as I'm concerned. There was something so incredibly special about bringing those forces together, the spiritual drive that we all have in some way for greater meaning, for a higher purpose, for more empowerment, whatever that is, whatever that spiritual value is, with ending the outrage of oppression. <coughs> Combining those two forces, those wonderful forces that make us human beings, putting them together and launching a social action, Satyagra, in that moment, 9-11-1906. So I heard that people around the world were celebrating the 100th anniversary in 2006 on 9-11. So I said, I'm going to organize. God, I was always a big fan of Gandhi's. If I had one person, before I started doing this, <clears throat> if I had one person I wanted to meet in all history, it was Gandhi. I could have gone back in time with you and said, sir. It would have been really great to sit and have tea with Gandhi, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be such a fun thing to do? Oh, my God. Oh, and on one of my trips to India, <laughs> I went to uh, Sabamarti Ashram in, in Ahmedabad and uh, dressed like this and people were staring and some people were jumping like, oh my gosh, like, is this real or is he a ghost or what? <clears throat> um, but one of the volunteers said, came up to me and she was such a sweet young lady. She came up to me and she said, would you mind sitting on the cushion here where where Bapu sat, because we have a, a group from a school of social work coming, and you could address them. The birth of Satya in Santa Fe, New Mexico, in my hometown. Anybody been to Santa Fe? No? Okay, you should come. It's a really nice place. <clears throat> uh, very different. Very, very different than Sri Lanka. And we held a showing of the movie Gandhi, Richard Attenborough's movie Gandhi, with Ben Kingsley playing Gandhi, of course. Does a much better job than I do. <clears throat> um, and about 45 people came, and it was very, very successful. Uh, the United States had invaded Iraq, and so we were protesting the war, and we were trying to, to bring it to an end, and not being very successful at doing that. Um, but many of us protested. So the, the church asked me to come back and do another talk on Gandhi's philosophy. And so I said, sure, and I did that. And it was also very successful. And then they said, would you come back and do a Sunday morning service? This is where Dr. Reddy's joke comes into play. <clears throat> and I said, of course, how about since Mr. Gandhi and I share the same hairstylist, I'll just come as him. <clears throat> and I had no intention of doing it. I, I don't even know where that idea came from, but it came out of my mouth. I made a joke about it. And um, I had about three months to think about it. 
And I went ahead and did it. And I got my friend, uh, Doug Stewart, who is a, a playwright and a psychologist, to interview me. He brought an old 1940s microphone and a stand, one of those old microphones, which was kind of fun. Um, and it went on for about uh, 30 minutes or so with the interview. There were about 45 people there. Um, and we only had like another 15 minutes or so, and then the next uh, service was going to start in the church. And we opened it up to a few minutes of questions. And this really, really interesting thing happened. I just stayed in the character of Gandhiji, answering people's questions. And people ask questions about their kids. And they ask questions about our president in the United States, George W. Bush. And they ask questions about what to do about uh, their son who was in prison. And I just stayed with it and kept moving with answering from what felt like some level of inspiration. And they had to kick us out because we kept going. We only had 10 minutes left, but we went on for another 45 minutes with all these questions from people. And one of the most honored things ever in my life happened at the end of it. There was a 92-year-old man there who was a follower, follower of Gandhiji in World War II. So think, think about that. An American, World War II, <clears throat> refused to fight against the Nazis because it was violence and he wouldn't do it. So just like put your mind in that history moment. If you can just imagine what that must have been like to not fight against the Nazis, right? So they put him away in a uh, camp, made him do work in the fields and construction work and things like that. And he came up to me after that uh, presentation and he was crying and he just said, I have been a follower of Gandhi's my whole life and you just nailed it. You hit it right on the mark and it was perfect. And I just felt so honored by this man. And that was 122 presentations ago. This is number 123. Uh, it's, been a, it's been quite a journey. So I wanted to talk tonight about uh, two aspects that I think are potentially, at least in my mind, the most important aspects of uh, Gandhiji's teachings. Uh, ahimsa and personal evolution. And uh, your Excellency touched on both of those in your talk, so th thank you for the appetite. What do uh, Ahimsa and personal evolution have to do with corporate life? Well, let's ask the question, what are corporations for? What is the purpose of a corporation? Most people would say the purpose of a corporation is to make some kind of a product out of raw materials and sell it, right? In the United States, under United States law, <clears throat> corporations have to decide, according to law, they have to decide to serve their stockholders' profit as a first priority. So there's a problem with corporate life right off the start, right from the beginning, how corporations are structured. I'm not sure how they're structured here in Sri Lanka or in India, um, but that's how they're structured in the United States. And to me, that's really problematic that we have that kind of structure. There are some really interesting things happening. Canada now has a B corporation, the letter B, which has to do with doing good in the world. The corporation being a service entity for the people, for the environment, for actually doing good. 
So can we start to think that maybe there's some glimmers of hope? And maybe I don't know enough about, oh, for sure I don't know enough about Sri Lanka to be able to say what's true here in terms of corporations. And again, for India as well. But if we start to think about the priorities that corporations have, and maybe we could begin to consider that it's time for a revolution in the corporation life of this planet. We could even start to imagine right here tonight what that kind of a revolution might be like in existence as a corporation. The last hundred years or so, those charter boards disappeared or maybe some obvious reasons of greed and corruption, as far as I can see. So here's one possibility that we tonight, we could begin to think about what would it be like to start a revolution in the corporate world? What would it be like to start to think about ahimsa, not just Nonviolence, ah, uh, right? Not himsa, violence. Not just nonviolence, but ahimsa in the greater version of it, as I think Ganaji was teaching us, of this divine love that's within each of us, reaching out and acknowledging the divine love in others around us. Acknowledging the divine love within all the people who buy our products that all of our customers deserve the very best that we can give them from any corporation. And that every corporation, everyone, could be standing on the power of taking good care of the earth rather than destroying the earth. So that generations to come would know that here in this moment, there was a turning point across our, our whole world. A turning point that started to bring forward in a, an incredibly strong way the principle of Ahimsa, of love coming from without my heart into your heart, my company into your life, how a corporation itself could turn into a messenger of peace. And that someday we might be able to even see the Nobel Peace Prize awarded to a corporation, not just to a person. I think that would be a really exciting vision to have. To me, Ahimsa says and means that there are no differences amongst us that actually matter. That we are united as human beings. That we are all the same. And all of these divisions that are set up, religious divisions, cultural, gender, economic, all of the divisions that exist are completely fabricated. None of them are factual. None of them are true. What's true is that we are all the same. We all want the same thing. We all want peace in our own world, in our own lives. We want our children to grow up in a peaceful world, to be able to realize that themselves, when I used to have uh, my workshops, if someone's phone rang like that, we made them stand up and do a little dance. <laughs> <laughs> I, we won't make you do that today. I should have said that at the beginning, but that would have been fun, wouldn't it? Oh, just kidding, just kidding. An evil person, and that justifies killing them. And it simply starts with that sense of impatience. So perhaps we could take on Gandhi's second idea about personal evolution, and we could begin to consider that so many of the troubles in humanity across this world come because we haven't evolved enough yet. We haven't grown enough yet within our own selves. 
we still hold on to some of these old biases that get us in trouble and they're not sustainable. They sap our energy. They take away from us the love, the ahimsa that we have for each other. But I think when is allowed to, naturally comes up to the forefront for us. Personal evolution is the prime example, if you take a theme all the way through Gandhi's life, constantly changing. It's like His Excellency said earlier, <clears throat> don't hold me to the truth I said a couple years ago because I'm evolving. And you can just follow my path of evolution, right, if you want to. My life is my message, he said. Part of that message was, we all need to change, we all do change, we all need to continue to evolve. If we're holding ahimsa, if we're holding this divine love within ourselves to love the, the divine love in other people, and we hold that up as a prime purpose for our lives, a prime purpose for our corporations, a prime purpose for our endeavors, then personal evolution, if we do that, if we hold that up in that sort of way, personal evolution will naturally follow that divine love. Sitting inside of Marti Ashram for those days that I was there, uh, we meditated out on the front uh, portal, the, the porch that was there. And um, people came and joined, you know? They came and sat with us. And, this one uh, elderly woman had been sweeping the grounds with a rake for like 75 years, <laughs> every day. She had known Gandhi when she was a little girl and remembered him being there, you know. Um, it was amazing being in her presence. So if we take this thought that I'm proposing here, this thought of, that the divine love within me, that, that shape and form of ahimsa, that's within me. And I know it's within me because I've, I've found it through the help of my good friend, Mr. Gandhi. And I know that with the help of Mr. Gandhi, that I've been able to find that divine love in other people as well. I've been able to see it, I've been able to feel it, literally, like sometimes feel it with my hand, like literally to feel it. How about if we all just take a nice easy breath and we'll close our eyes and we'll pretend, just for a moment, it looks out over the Sabamarti River down below. And let's just close our eyes Just picture a nice long porch going right across the top of the ridge that looks out over the river. Gandhiji would come out and he'd sit and have satsang with the people who live there at the ashram. And we're sitting with all the other people from the villages who come around, who come every day to soak up the presence of the Mahatma. And what we might notice while we're sitting in this beautiful space, what we might notice is what people say about Gandhiji. And when he walks into a room, the room suddenly feels joyful at peace. So let's just tune into that idea for just a moment. And we see Gandhi come and sit down on his cushion, that same cushion that I sat on. And everyone gets really quiet. There's a very large crowd, 300, 400 people, something like that. Everyone gets really quiet. They want to catch every word.
And Gandhiji begins to speak. Maybe it's a miracle. Maybe the timing is just right. But somehow, he speaks right to your heart. And just hold that sense of peace in your own heart, your own spirit. And know that your neighbor sitting next to you has that same divine peace within them, just like you're feeling now. So we'll let the other Ashramites continue with their time with Gandhiji. And we'll pull ourselves away and come back to this room. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Could anybody see it? Anybody see it? Yeah? No? Okay. Could anybody feel it? Feel the peace? Yeah? There's that divine love that's right there with us. All the time. There wasn't anything special about what we just did, right? And for you folks who felt it and saw it, guess where you felt it and saw it? It wasn't over in India. It was right here inside, right? <clears throat> Which means you have it. You already have it. That's what's so brilliant about it. That's what's so brilliant about Gandhiji's message, that it was light years ahead of other other teachers, as far as I'm okay, concerned. Get ready. It was so incredibly powerful. So when you think about that famous phrase of his, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. Who? Me? <laughs> Me be the change? <clears throat> uh, okay. Okay, I'll argue that. And, and you go about doing it, right? But to say, yeah, like, who else? You're going to wait around for somebody else to do it? Wait till somebody else is compassionate? Wait till somebody else is kind? Somebody else is peaceful? And then you're going to be peaceful? That's not how it works. That's where it goes. That's how it moves. Through us, to our family, to our friends, to our community, to our colleagues, to the world, like Gandhi's message. And you don't have to have you know, delusions of grandeur like some people, but trying to be Gandhi or something. You don't have to do that. Just simply love people more and more and more, right? You know, people are mean. People that are they're cruel and they're violent and they're like, like hurtful. That's pretty powerful. It only takes 60 seconds. 120 seconds to feel that kind of love, that kind of presence, that kind of peace? What if, so, so many corporations are doing this these days, what if at the board meetings of corporations, they put themselves into a meditative state, and they said, what is the purpose of our corporation? To make profit or to be of service? To only look at, at the dollar or the rupee as the number one goal or to contribute to the community? Let's meditate on that question and see what kind of answer you come up with. I'm just a humble social worker from the state of Michigan and New Mexico in the United States. One of the most wonderful things that was told to me was told to me in my presence was told to another person and that was from my youngest daughter Lexi and Lexi said to this other person because the other person said what's it been like having Gandhi as a dad <laughs> and my wonderful daughter uh, Lexi said well he's a lot less angry than he used to be <laughs> and I went angry well, was I angry? And she just she was 16 and she did. Anybody have teenagers? Teenage girls? Yeah. So she did this. 
<laughs> oh my God, Dad, you don't know yourself at all. You know, she just laughed at me because um, one of the great blessings of Mr. Gandhi coming into my life has been to open up my heart in a way towards my family, towards my friends, and towards people around the world uh, in a way that just has never happened before. So that blessing comes to me when I get to be with good-hearted, like-minded souls. So today, tonight, is one of those great blessings. And I couldn't have done it without all of you being here. So thank you very, very much from my heart. Namaste. Insights. On behalf of the Sri Lanka India Society, as a token of appreciation, we would like to present a memento to our guest speaker, Professor John McAvenshi. To do the honors, I kindly invite His Excellency, the High Commissioner, Gopal Bhagli, and I also request the President and Secretary of the Sri Lanka India Society, Mr. Kishore Reddy and Mrs. Kaila Sepulay to join. So I hope you enjoy it. It's great with uh, like chips, tomatoes, things like that. Yeah. Society. Our keynote speaker, Professor John McCarthy, peace messenger, social leader, motivational speaker, university lecturer, spiritual coach, and narrative therapist. Mr. Kishore Reddy, president of the Sri Lanka India Society. Mrs. Renuka Ekanayaka, director, SAAF Cultural Center. There's a bunch of Dilak D. Sarisa, Mr. Chandra Shafter, Vice Patron, Dr. Satyanjal Pandey, Deputy High Commissioner, Professor Dr. Ankuran Datta, Director of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, and other distinguished invite invitees of the High Commission of India. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank the ex His Excellency Gopal Bhakke for gracing this occasion as the chief guest and for speaking a few words about Mahatma Gandhi in commemoration of the Gandhi Jayanti Day which falls today, 2nd October. We are grateful to Professor Don McKenzie for accepting our invitation and delivering the Mahatma Gandhi oration titled Relevance of Gandhian Principles in Social and Corporate Life, which was very insightful and kept the audience spellbound. We also thank our friends at the High Commission for their unceded support for all the society's activities. We are indebted to Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center for collab collaborating with the Sri Lanka India Society to make this event possible for their support and assistance in providing the VCIS auditorium for this event. In particular, we thank Professor Dr. Ankuran Datta, Director of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, who has been instrumental in organizing this event. We express our sincere thanks to the Honourable Ministers, Members of Parliament and esteemed guests and members of the society who have taken time out of their busy schedule to attend this event. We would also like to thank the members of the media for taking interest in covering the event. We all invite you all for a refreshment after this event. Thank you. Um.